The departmental talk I'm going to give today is uh, called Compassion for the Dark Side. Now, this is really to capture the fact that you know, people often think that compassion is about kindness and happiness and all of that stuff, which is good, I'm not against it, but in reality, uh, compassion is important for when you're confronting the difficulties in life. Uh, it's compassion for uh, problems such as depression, anxiety, but also rage and hatred. Okay, so understanding that rage and hatred, are, what sits behind rage and hatred are often things such as fear, loss and loneliness, is very important for helping people to develop compassion. So compassion for the things that we like or the people we like, that's great, I'm all in favor of that. But the real tough compassion and the world changing process of compassion are for the people we don't like and the things we don't like. And that doesn't mean being submissive or compliant, it can often be a very courageous orientation to it, but compassion is the sensitivity to engage with the difficult things in life and that includes engaging with the dark side. And I think uh, for those of you who've watched Star Wars, one of the most interesting things in Star Wars is the fact that Luke Skywalker actually chooses to save his father right at the end. And that concept of that even when people have been caught in the dark side, how do we actually rescue them from the pain and hatred that they're caught in? And there are many um, uh, programs around the world now who are working with developing compassion for people who've got caught in the dark side. So that's partly what I'm going to be talking about today. Thank you very much. So this is a slight departure from our usual because often people invite me to talk about compassion focused therapy, but we're going to look at compassion in a much wider context. But um, we like to give some advice. So the advice for today is if at first you don't succeed, skydiving is not for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start off with uh, one minute of Jung, uh, of a Jung interview, because I think he says some very interesting things. So here we go. Oops. It's great when technology works. You don't man, you don't man doesn't stand forever his nullification. It's the second part you're interested in. Once there will be uh, a reaction. And uh, I see I see it setting in, you know, when I think of my patients, they all seek their own existence and to assure their existence against that complete atomization into nothingness or into meaninglessness. Man cannot stand a meaningless life. We need more understanding of human nature because the only real danger that exists is man himself. He is the great danger and we are pitifully unaware of it. We know nothing of man, far too little. His psyche should be studied because we are the origin of all coming evil. We are the origin of all coming evil. So I think that's a really interesting um, idea. And Jung was arguing this uh, many, many years ago. Now I think the point is we do understand a lot more about this issue that we call evil. And uh, that's what I'm going to address now. So firstly then, let's think about why compassion would be for the dark side. Because compassion really, by most definitions, would be something like sensitivity to suffering in self and others with a commitment to try and alleviate and prevent it. So that would be a standard sort of definition of what compassion is. But if we look at the dark side, we would see that the dark side stands for exactly the opposite. This is insensitivity to the suffering of self and others and a carelessly or purposely, uh, and carelessly or purposely causing it. Now, of course, some individuals can be very sensitive to their own suffering and promote their own well-being and greed. But there is a sense in which the dark side can also be about the way in which we treat ourselves with self-criticism or getting heavily into drugs and alcohol or engage in self-cutting behavior and so forth. So it sort of works to a degree. The other way in which we can think about this is to make a distinction between pro-social behavior, which involves compassion, altruism, kindness, and a whole range of other things, and also underpins principles of ethics and morality. In contrast, anti-social behavior is harmful, selfish, usually self-focused and callous. And the question of the ethics that underpin uh, antisocial behavior are indeed questionable. You could make an argument that we go to war in order to save our own tribe from the 
dangers and threats of the opposing tribe, in which case there is a morality behind war and the things that we do. But again, the whole issue of antisocial behavior is that it is focused on causing harm rather than avoiding harm. So why do we have a dark side? Why do we have such capacity for antisocial behavior? Well, let's start at the beginning. The universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Nobody really understands how it came into existence. It's the Big Bang. But why something exists rather than nothing is uh, unknown. So we are being here. Uh, this planet has been here for about 4.5 billion years. And during that time, there's been an ongoing development. And of course, at some point, the beginnings of life. There's been at least four major extinctions, and had those not happened, then certainly you and I wouldn't be here. So to some extent, the creation of life forms and the creation of different types of minds are very much the accident of evolution, really. And we're all part of the flow of life. So there we are, part of this uh, life, which could be traced back to the reptilian forms and on through the mammals, and here we are at the top of the tree, although some people would say that isn't our right place because we can be so damaging. The person who most, uh, uh, who really brought this into consciousness is, of course, um, Charles Darwin, who set sail on the Beagle and on his return wrote the book The Origin of Species, where he pointed out that uh, species transform gradually over time through a process of natural selection. And this is powered by two basic forces, survival and reproduction. So bodies and brains are basically built for two reasons to survive for at least a short period of time in order to reproduce. Now, Darwin didn't know about genes. They were just in the beginning of being understood with Mendel and, and his peas and so on. But we now know that genes are a particular way in which information is carried from one generation to the next. So DNA carries the information for building bodies and minds to carry those genes around. And they will create rabbits and monkeys and humans and elephants and all the rest. Okay. So this is the process by which one form, one pattern gets replicated in generation after generation after generation. So you come into existence because your parents put their genes together and those genes built you. And you will go out of existence and if you've recreated, you will leave your pattern of genes to go on recreating. Bodies, for the most part, are short-lived, subject to disease, injury and predation. And we experience pain, fear and anxiety partly because this is all to tell the body that it's under threat, it's been injured, or there's a malfunction. So we have built into us then this, we are biologically created beings which go through life for a period of time, and DNA builds into us minds and desires in order to achieve certain things. The two big ones are survival and reproduction. So survival then gives rise to motivations for feeding, defending oneself against predators and so on, and building shelters. Whereas reproduction gives rise to motivational systems for parental investment, uh, intersexual selection, and so on, building alliances. And these are the basis for the creation of phenotypes which are rooted in uh, motives, emotions, and so on. So we can track the way in which DNA builds bodies and builds minds in order to do certain things. And this is really important because... Jung's point was that these are archetypal forms. So we have archetypal forms for sexuality and caring for our offspring and tribalism because they're built into us. So there's no designer then. Okay? The other important point about evolution that we need to understand is that we have what are called trade-offs. So for example, why, don't we, why haven't we evolved unbreakable bones? Well, the reason is, is because unbreakable bones would be heavy, then you'd have to have more muscle. If you had more muscle, you would be heavier. If you were heavier, you'd be less agile. So we occupy a social niche, which is to be an agile primate. Another trade-off you get is where certain genes can have both a positive and a negative effect. So the genes that give you malaria are also the genes for... Sorry, the genes that protect you from malaria are also the same genes that would... Is make you vulnerable to sickle cell anemia. In other words, the same gene can have a positive but also a negative benefit. Stress hormones, of course, we know that when you become stressed, you produce cortisol, but that has a negative impact on your, in your, on your immune system. So once again, the body is not built as this fantastically well-organized uh, organism. Actually, it's full of these different kinds of trade-offs where you get advantages one area and disadvantages another one. Think of moods and emotions, they're pretty good. 
but if they become too intense or they last too long, then you can end up feeling in quite dire straits. Don't think every emotion or every mood is an advantage. Only in general do things need to be advantage, but they can easily become dysregulated. So here's another example. Think of plumage of the antler. Uh, sorry, think of plumage of the antler. Antler, say that, please. Uh, plumage of the peacock. Now, the peacock tail is uh, great, but it's a great disadvantage for running away from predators. Antler size, actually, the uh, deer can get their he head scored in trees, in which case they can't escape. Fireflies grow in the dark, which are great for bats that can see them and eat them. So why would you develop, why would you evolve these capacities? Well, because all of them are sexual attractions. So the advantage of having these as sexual attractions outweighs the disadvantage of them also aiding predators. Think of diarrhea, vomiting, and coughing. Why do you have that? Because people can actually die from it. Well, these are your natural mechanisms for removing noxious substances. And if you think about our hands free upright walking, there's a big disadvantage with that because as women in the audience will know, when we stood up and started to move our hands and so on, your birth canal narrowed right at the point when the baby's head was getting bigger. And so what happens is our babies are the most immature babies of all primates. And unfortunately, you have the most painful and dangerous birth of all primates. So evolution has not done the ladies in the, in the audience any favors at all. It's not done you any favors at all. So this is important then, because when we follow an evolutionary story, what we're following is the conservation of form and the modification of form over time. Now that's going to be a real important understanding about the dark side, because the dark side is rooted in some of the motivations that underpin survival and uh, sexual competition. So if we look at the brain, and the brain is full of trade-offs as well, you have a brain that has evolved within it. You have a brain that's being built for you, not by you. And your brain will come ready packed, ready made, with motivations for harm avoidance, the ability to distinguish food from poison, an interest in sexuality when you become old enough, uh, interest in caring, particularly for your own offspring, and a seeking for status and so forth. You will have built into you a whole range of emotions for anger and so on. And you share this with many other animals. That's why, tragically for them, they've become experimental subjects where we've learnt a lot about the physiology of emotions by studying animal brains. If their brains were totally different to yours, it would be pretty useless knowledge. But about two million years ago, we also started to evolve a capacity for getting smart. We developed a capacity for language and thinking and a certain kind of knowing awareness. We became capable of self-criticism. It's very unlikely that any other species has this. We don't think chimpanzees have this to any significant degree. They may have it a little, but chimpanzees almost certainly don't worry about putting on weight or having upset the neighbors or uh, what they're going to do next year. Humans do because we have this capacity for thinking, for insight. The point about this is that the way in which we think can interact with our emotional and motivational systems in such a way that it can literally drive us crazy. We can ruminate on things that we're unhappy about or frightened about, and therefore keep our bodies constantly aroused in anxious state. Or we can ruminate about things that are, have made us angry and keep our bodies in angry, stressful states. So imagine a zebra running away from a lion. What happens is once the zebra has got away, because there is no sensory input to the zebra, the zebra will calm down quite quickly. But for humans who have this capacity for thinking, we are able to imagine the worst and focus on being self-critical and so forth. So for a human, you've got away from the lion, but then you might start thinking, can you imagine if I'd been caught? Can you imagine being killed and eaten by a lion? Oh my god. You wake up in the middle of the night thinking, supposing there are two lions tomorrow, what will I do? I don't know. Why aren't I in the University of Queensland listening to Paul? Why am I in this lion infested place? So there we are. So this means then that um, we can literally spiral. The way in which we use our new minds is very important. One other thing that's really important is that also our new minds and uh, the way in which our minds and bodies work is very much linked into the social context in which we live. So culture plays a massive role in the organization of mind, particularly in the kinds of things we think about 
and the kinds of emotions and motives that get stimulated in us. And in fact, I wrote a paper uh, over 20 years ago arguing that this understanding the link between our evolved biology and social culture should be the basis of clinical psychology. Uh, as you can see, loads of people haven't taken it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's think about these minds then that we've got that evolution is concerned with. The most important thing is to recognize that something that Robert Ornstein argued about many years ago, which is actually your mind is a mosaic of potential. You have this idea that you are a single unitary self, but in fact this is an illusion. So that he says the long progression in our self-understanding has been from a simple, usually intellectual view to the view that the mind is a mixed structure for it contains a complex talents, modules, and policies within. All these general components of mind can act independently of each other. They may well have different priorities. So this fits very nicely with the concept of multiple drives that Freud talked about and archetypes that Jung talked about. But even here is an introductory textbook that says, you are a university universe, a collection of words within words. Your brain is probably the most complicated and amazing device in existence. Through its actions, you're capable of music, art, science, war. Your potential for love and compassion coexists with your potential for aggression, hatred. And so this is really important, that the problem we have with the mind is it is, it is a cacophony of many different potentials. We are thoughtful. We are thoughtless. We are kind. And we are cruel. We are creative, destructive, brave, stupid. We are heroes, villains, visionary, and we are blind. We are responsible and responsible. We are all what we have done and what we will do. So we all have a duty to do the right thing. So the point is that understanding the human mind is full of this amazing cacophony of possibilities for um, the dark side as well as the positive side. And one of the things I'm going to argue now is that the dark side is partly a tragedy. It's a tragedy because we've got this mind that evolution has built for us full of all these amazing possibilities and we haven't got a clue how to train it or guide it or drive it and that's really quite important. Now a mind that does not know itself, and this is something the Buddha pointed out, is a very dangerous, cruel and crazy mind because when you take mammalian motives and you give them social intelligence such as knowing awareness, empathic awareness and knowing intentionality Goodness knows what you end up with. Take sexuality, put it into an intelligent mind, and you end up with pornography and sex trafficking. So it's very important to understand that the motive systems are still pretty basic, but the way in which our human social intelligence operates them can be for good or for bad. So imagine the evolution of human mind that has these basic motives for harm avoidance or resource acquisition, feeding, sexual competition, caring. Then again, the question is, what do we do with them? How do we cultivate them? How do we use them? How do we guide them? Now, this is important because, for example, let's look at feeding behavior. Now, all moving life forms must eat other life forms, okay? And in order to do that, they have to be insensitive to the pain they cause prey. And there's quite an interesting um, series of papers looking at the origins of cruelty are actually in the predator system. So uh, you have to be, become insensitive to the pain that you're call, causing. So lions, for example, are insensitive to the screams of the prey they're killing. And this is true for humans as well. Okay, so we live, we are born as an organic species into a, as a life form that has to eat other life forms. But this is what we do with our intelligence. We have factory farms which are just absolutely horrendous. Okay, so we are a predator that is immensely cruel. We are the cruelest predator that has ever existed. Far crueler than Trianosaurus rex. Can you imagine sentencing animals to live like this? This is what we do with our intelligence. Same motivational system to feed, but that's what we do. We also have a range of built-in biases 
we can be biased, into which our, our biases can operate at a conscious or unconscious level. And these biases are typically self-focused. So studies are done by asking people to, uh, t um, contacting them on their iPhones and asking them to say what they've just been thinking about. And 70% of the time, people say, oh, I've been thinking about me, actually. What I'm going to do, what I'm planning to do, what I have done should be there. We also know that we are biologically built to be very genetically kin-focused. And this is very easily demonstrated because if you have a baby in hospital and they take your baby away to weigh it, and they come back an hour later and they say, I'm terribly sorry, we've got some good news and some bad news. I tell you what, the bad news is we've lost the name tag, so we haven't got any idea who your baby is. But now the good news, we've had some wonderful babies born this morning, and if you just go down to the delivery room, you can choose one. Just think. Maybe you've got a boy, she's like a girl, now she's chance, right? Yeah. So it all works out to the best in the end, doesn't it? <laughs> it doesn't really work. Okay, so imagine, classic example, that there are children in a burning house. You have the opportunity to save 50, or you can save your own. What are you going to do? These are the kinds of dilemmas that, you know, evolutionary psychologists kind of like to pose people and everything, to highlight the fact that you're biologically orientated to look after your own genes. We're also very in-group, and Maddie here is doing a lot of brilliant work on in-group, out-group work. We're also very in-group based, and, you've, and for those of you who've done your remember your social psychology degrees, you can get people to be in groups and out groups very quickly. The problem with it is, once you get in group, out group, it's very easy to get out groups to do bad things to each other. And so, we know that all over the world, every five seconds a child dies of starvation, and yet we will sit down to this, and we know certainly in Europe, probably here as well, the amount of food we throw away is outrageous. We know, too, that uh, millions upon millions upon millions of children grow up in the slums of the world, be it in South America or wherever it is, America, India and so on and so on, and yet we build these mansions taking up huge amounts of land and resources. This is not a religious point, but why would you want to invent this way to kill somebody? And in England, we used to have things called hang drawing and quartering. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want somebody to suffer? so much, and when they're going to die anyway, why not just kill them? And what about cruelty as entertainment? I'm very interested in the Romans because I think they are probably one of the most callous societies that ever existed. And yet, they also gave us things like, you know, roads and so on and so on. But they were an immensely callous society. And in fact, Romans, uh, gladiators very rarely fought each other that much because they were expensive. They were killing machines and they were taught to kill for enjoyment. So they would be up against prisoners of war and slaves and criminals, and the idea wasn't to kill them too quickly, but to kill them in an entertaining way. 700 years. In the opening three months of the Colosseum, 10,000 people were killed for entertainment. What's really interesting now, if you look at all of our, uh, our um, entertainments, particularly coming over from the America and other places, you find there's a lot of vengeance entertainment. So vengeance entertainment is where you get the guy, bad guys to do really bad guys, to rape all the babies and everything. And then in comes Schwarzenegger, who can now blow their legs off. And everybody goes, great! We love to see them suffer because they deserve it. So everybody gets excited. And in fact, if you look at the history of the last 10 years, uh, vengeful entertainment, vengeful violence, where the good guys come and do things to the bad guys, uh, and then we all go home feeling happy. That has increased enormously, and I think we should be seriously worried about it. Tribalism, we know, of course. If you look at what happened in the First World War, some of the horrors that were created, I mean, why on earth humans want to create these things for each other? And this is how we use our intelligence. And we're a very submissive species. Okay? We're, we think we're very... Uh, powerful and strong and dominant and individual. No, we're not. We're incredibly submissive. We go along with our groups. We go along with our leaders uh, who ask the most ridiculous things of us. There's a wonderful book called, which we were talking about earlier called Crimes of Obedience. And that's what you end up with. And this is important because it means that we need to understand that humans really, the history of humanity is not good. Okay? So you have the history of civilization and the pyramids and the um, the Great Wall of China, all of which were bought, built by slaves, actually. The history of torture, the history of women as property. Think about the fact that for a thousand years, Chinese mothers broke the feet of their children to fit in with a social status of um, approval. 
Can you imagine doing that? Breaking your baby's feet down into six or eight. Female genital mutilation, domestic violence. Right? We are crazy. All right? Jung is right, you know. We need to understand that humans are mad because we purposely, purposely cause harm. And yet sometimes we think it's for good reasons. So what do we teach our children? Well, the problem with the problem with education at the moment it has the hierarchy of, of uh, subjects. So math and sciences are regarded as good. Humanities a little bit, arts not so much. Do we teach them about ourselves, about the brain, the body, where it comes from, how it works? No, we don't. Certainly when I was growing up, I wasn't taught anything about the way in which the brain evolved and the fact that my brain is, is made to be easily driven crazy. Nobody told me that. And we live in these uh, cultures of competing narcissism, which I'll explore in a moment, and in cultures of compliance. Now, cultures of compliance are very dangerous, okay, because humans will do that. But this, is, this is a letter extracted from a Holocaust survivor, which was published in a, a book called Parent to Child. And I think this is a very moving thing, which talks about the nature of education. Education, the wrong kind of education, or just educating in information, isn't good enough. I am a survival of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no sh man should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers, children poisoned by educated physicians, infants killed by trained nurses, women and babies shot and burned by high school and college graduates. I am, so I am suspicious of education. My request is help your students become human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, educated Eichmanns. Reading, writing, arithmetic are important, but only if they serve to make the children more humane. So this is really important to begin to understand that actually education, and in places like universities, particularly University of Queensland, there is more to education than just passing on information. So it is our educated leaders who run our banks and corrupt financial institutions. It's our educated that runs our industries that are polluting the world. It's our educated that are running our politics of privilege and that have lost sight of helping the poor and creating a more moral, just and fair world. It's the educated that run our media and seek to shame and humiliate, and it's the educated that run our entertainments that use more and more violence and sedated to amuse us. We know this, and this is partly linked to some of the work of Philip Zimbardo's work about how you can get good people to do bad things. Humans have a serious dark side, and we are all complicit in allowing the dark side to ripple around our minds and around the world. So clues to the problems may lie in these involved motivational systems and how they get organized inside of us. So here's a typical paper, the idea that these particular kinds of goals for competition, for resource, only for selfishness and so forth, are really all part of an underlying motivational pattern. So strategic motives then are innate strategies that build motives. Now let's just look at one of them, which is competing for resources, which has become incredibly important in the post-agricultural uh, history of humanity. Up until the origins of agriculture, humans were actually, as far as this records can tell, relatively peaceful and they shared resources because their lives depended upon sharing rather than uh, acquiring and holding. But once you get agriculture then there becomes an advantage in holding on to your resources and not sharing and you can have more than other people and thereby you can do better than them. And so when you have the competitive psychology activated in your culture, this will influence the attention, the thinking, the behavior, fantasies and so on of individuals in whom competitiveness is being developed. And one of the things we know about competitiveness is that as people become richer and they become more powerful, actually they, they become um, less compassionate. It's quite interesting. Uh, this is the work of uh, Dasha Keltner and various others, but there's lots of studies now showing that as people become more wealthy, they become more orientated to not paying their taxes more orientated to having private education, more orientated to moving out of the system, to be in control of their own lives, to hold their resources and not share their resources. And there are very good evolutionary reasons why that's so, but the consequences are quite serious. Let me read you from a report from the, the children we mean to raise, the messages adults are sending about values. This is from the Harvard University. 
and this is their executive summary, our youth's values appear to be awry. The messages that adults are sending may be the heart of the problem. According to recent national survey, a large majority of youth across a wide spectrum of races, cultures, and classes appear to value aspects of personal success, achievement, and happiness over concern for others. We asked youth to rank what was the most important to them, achieving at a high level, happiness, feeling good most of the time, or caring for others. Almost 80% of youth picked high achievement or happiness as their top choice, while only 20% selected caring for others. Youth also ranked fairness low in relation to several other values, and that's important. For example, they were far more likely to rank hard work above fairness. Some youth made it clear to us that their self-interest is paramount. If you're not happy, life is nothing. After that, you want to do well. And after that, expend any excess energy on others. So according to our data, youth aren't buying the idea that compassion is a good value. About 80% of youth in our survey reported their parents were more concerned about achievement or happiness than caring for others. And this is important because parents think they're nice, but what they focus on is the achievement of their children at school. How well are you doing? How well are you doing? Are you passing your exams? Because those parents, quite understandably, not seem want their children to succeed in a competitive environment. A similar percentage of youth perceive teachers as prioritizing students' achievements over their caring. Youth were also three times more likely to agree than disagree with the statement, my parents are prouder if I get good grades in my class than if I'm a caring community member in class and school. Our conversations with and observations of parents also suggest that the power and frequency of parents' daily messages about achievement and happiness are drowning out their message for concern of others. Now we were interested in this, a little bit of data for you, we were interested in it. So why, why all the competition? Is it competition for greed or have we created a deeply fearful society that we are so frightened of not keeping up? So we developed a, a scale which looked at the uh, competing to avoid inferiority. And it had, val it had uh, things such as to be valued, I have to strive to succeed, life is a competition, people compare me to others to see if I match up. But we also had non-striving competition. Others will accept me if I fail, I don't feel under pressure to prove myself, you are loved for what you are and not what you achieve. So there we had this, what we call insecure striving and secure striving. And this is impatience. And what you find, not unsurprisingly perhaps, is that insecure striving, which is the purple color, is highly linked to feeling inferior, being submissive, and shame. Whereas feeling secure is negatively linked. So the more secure you feel, you don't need to go out there and compete, so forth, the lower your submissive behavior, the lower your shame, and the, lower, and the higher your comparison, the more favorable you are. And in regard to stress, anxiety, and depression, exactly the same message. And look at this, you know, in the group of patients, insecure striving is highly linked to feeling stressed. The feeling, I'm not doing well enough, I need to be able to achieve more, I've got to be able to do more, have more, and so on. And so the point is that when we look at actually the many of the people that come through our clinics, and this is increasingly a problem in society, which is being written about by many others, is a sense of loneliness, a sense of abandonment, a sense of meaningless, as uh, Jung was talking about. Increasingly, people are choosing solitary lifestyles, but actually becoming uh, depressed. And so a lot of the problems we have is this concept of being cast out. And these are core issues in mental health, the idea of being the unloved, unwanted, and ashamed. So what to do? Well, the point about all of that I've been talking about is there are motivational systems that will offset the dark side. We understand the dark side. It's partly a result of how our brains have evolved. It's not our fault. It is not our fault we have these biological tendencies to focus on our own kin. It's not our fault that we're tribal. It's not our fault that we can enjoy sadistic vengeance. But it is our responsibility. It is our responsibility to understand how this brain has been built and start to make decisions about how we want our minds to work, how we want our relationships to work, how we want our organizations to work. Because your mind is like a garden. If you don't cultivate it, it will grow. The weeds will grow and the grasses will grow. And you may not like the way it turns out. And that's what we've been doing over the last few thousand years. We've just allowed things to grow according to whatever forces turn up in the mind, according to whatever bully gets in control 
of power it can organize the rest of us. But the time has come really for us to begin to understand the nature of the mind and look deeply into the dark side without taking responsibility, but taking, without taking blame for it, but taking control. So recent scientific studies then have begun to focus on how do you foster forms of caring and altruism? How did they evolve? Well, they evolve partly with parental investment and also cooperative behavior. And recently, scientific focus has been on how different forms of altruism actually evolve. So this is related to things like the survival of offspring, parental investment, survival of friendships and groups, and that every human, early humans, we now know, spend quite a lot of time caring for the sick and injured. In other words, archaeological, the archaeological record shows, if you go back a million years, that humans were caring for their sick and injured, almost something unheard of in other animals. And this means that they were surviving even though they had broken bones and had clearly infections and so on. So this, this desire, not just, to care for, not just to care for infants and children, but to care for the sick and the wounded and the needed is very clearly in the human genome. So i better move on here. So in terms of what is caring, this was a very useful definition that I took from Alan Fogel's work uh, back in 86 when I was developing the compassion formulation. Caring involves an awareness of the need to be nurturing, a motivation to nurture, the understanding of what is needed, an expression of those feelings, an ability to change your behavior according to the impact your behavior has. So when we think about caring behavior, we do have models which help us understand the nature of caring behavior, and we can look at these different dimensions of caring behavior to see how they can be cultivated and developed. One of the core processes that we now know is linked to pro-social behavior is the parasympathetic system, particularly the vagus. So there's now studies looking at the vagus nerve, how the vagus nerve works, and that's a, this is a big area, so I'm not going to go into it too much. And we know that the vagus nerve is very influenced by the qualities of affiliative and pro-social behavior in which it is embedded. And we also know that the vagus nerve is very much linked to pro-social traits. So individuals who have what we call stable or good heart rate variability, there are these individuals also tend to be more social. Not necessarily more compassion, it's a bit tricky, but they tend to be more social, more interested in, uh, in social activities and helping in a certain kind of level. So what we know then is that if you take the mammalian caring behavior, so for example rats and primates caring behavior, you wouldn't call them compassion, but if you match that with an intentionality, building an intentionality to be caring with a knowing awareness and a training and empathic connectedness, that's when you end up with compassion. So compassion is using our intelligence to foster and cultivate one of the most important motivational systems in the human mind. And this takes you into what compassion actually is, which is compassion is this ability to be sensitive to the suffering of self and others and form a commitment to do something about it. So that gives rise to two psychologies, the capacity for sensitivity, so you're not walking past on the other side of the road, being moved by the distress of others, emotionally moved, and also developing the wisdom to try to do something about it. Now that's important because this element of wisdom, the second psychology, is often forgotten. Compassion isn't just intentionality, okay? If I see somebody fall into the Brisbane River and I think, oh, I must jump in and save them, that's okay. But then I realize I can't swim, so I drown too. So that is not very wise. One of the things we need is to develop our wisdom and an understanding about how do we create a compassionate world? How do we create a more compassionate uh, set of organizations and schools and business and so forth? These are scientific questions. These are the kinds of questions that you know, um, Stan and James and others here are trying to think about. How do you do it? We know a little bit about what it is, but how do you do it? How do you get this motivational system to be able to work or even suppress some of the other more of the dark side? We also know that motivations, or motivations, have to have competencies, and we know what some of the competencies are for compassion. For example, empathy is important, distress tolerance, Courage. Courage is very important in compassion. And actually, for those of you who are interested in the religious side, probably Christianity ex uh, stresses the issue of compassion in uh, courage and compassion more than Buddhism in some ways. 
So we also know that lots of studies now showing that in cra when people behave in compassionate ways to others, particularly to others, they become happier themselves. Compassion, creating compassion to self and others, improves well-being, it improves creativity. Compassionate organizations or people that feel they're working within compassionate organizations tend to be more creative. Compassion has a massive impact on a whole range of physiological systems, including the frontal cortex and the immune system. And of course, compassion can be, a, can be a, a motivational focus for the development of ethics and the recognition of the social consequences of behavior. Another study that I'll share with you, which is by um, Jennifer Crocker and uh, Caraballo, which I really like, and we use, we use her measures. They were interested in this idea about does compassion, self-image goals, wanting to become a compassionate person, this issue of compassion and identity, how does that impact on students? And so they looked at these uh, compassion goals. So they had 13 items. All items began with the phase in the past week in the era of friendship, how much did you want to try uh, to or try to? And the items included things like be supportive of others, have compassion for others' mistakes and weaknesses, avoid doing anything that would be harmful to others. See, this issue of avoiding harm is really quite important in compassion. Uh, make a positive difference in somebody's life, be constructive in your comments, and so on. So those are the compassion items, how much did you want to do that? Whereas they had six items that looked at self-image goals. How much did you want to get others to recognize or acknowledge your positive qualities, convince others that you're right, avoid showing your weakness, avoid the possibility of being wrong, avoid being rejected by others. All that threat focus, you see the threat focus motivational system here. So what did they find? Average compassion goals predicted closeness, clear and connected feelings, and increased social support and trust over the semester whereas self-image goals kind of reduced that, they attenuated these effects. Average self-image goals, so being focused in on yourself and avoiding doing, uh, being rejected and competing to avoid inferiority, uh, predicted uh, conflict, loneliness, uh, afraid and confused feelings. People with compassionate goals create a supportive environment for themselves and others, but only if they do not have high self-image goals as well. So this is very clear evidence, there's a lot more studies, it's just one of many studies, to show that the goals that people pursue, certainly in their close relationships, have a major impact on their well-being and in the, the circle of friends around them. So if you are compassionate to others, you're more likely to create compassion coming back at you. Um, so we also know that practicing compassion changes the frontal cortex, loving kindness meditation increases positive emotions, uh, and compassion meditation over six weeks improves immune function and so on. Okay, so let's move on. <coughs> so I want to begin to wrap up now if I can. So this motivational system, right, which is easily supplanted by the competitive and the tribal motivational systems, is the system which is really at the root of well-being. So the evolution of caring behavior, being cared for in physiology, means that relationships are physiological regulators. There's a lot of evidence now that if you grow up feeling loved and cared for, this affects your genetic expression compared to being abused or neglected. Okay, and this is to do with what's called epigenetics. Your stress reactivity, how your HPA system and amygdala mature, is very much influenced by the quality of caring and affection you have in your early life. It affects your immune system. It, it develops your frontal cortex. If you grow up in a stressful, uncaring environment, your full cortex, frontal cortex develops differently than if you grow up in a caring environment. It affects the vulnerability to certain kinds of illnesses and the speed by which you will recover. Growing up in a caring environment affects your core values and your self-identities. And of course, it will help to you to develop compassion and empathy for others as well. We also know, and this is where the challenge comes for us, for the dark side, that there are dimensions to motivation that facilitate and inhibit it. So we can, it's easier to be compassionate to people we like than people we don't. It's easier to be compassionate if we know what we're doing than if we don't. It's easier to be compassionate to people we think deserve it than people we think don't, and that includes ourselves. Uh, it's easier to be compassionate if we have an empathic capacity. It's easier to be compassionate if we're less self-focused, more compassionate, and so on. So all of these are areas where we understand that compassion can have both facilitators and inhibitors. 
So I'm going to wrap up now by just saying there's a lot of confusion about compassion. You know, compassion is about kindness, I'll be kind to myself and all the rest of it. Is it just taking pain away? Is it submitting to the demands of others? No. Creating the conditions for building the courage, wisdom, and dedication to, fo to face what we need to face and aspire to be at our best. Okay, guided by a concern for the well-being of ourselves and others and our impact upon them. So compassion underpins an ethical moral life. I'm not against kindness, but I think you've got to be careful if you start going all that. And one of the things that drives me bonkers, if you want to drive me seriously bonkers, is to say compassion is about love. Love is a totally different process altogether. So let me now finish with some key issues about how we as educators and how we in universities and uh, so forth need to think. The function of education is to teach ones to think, this is uh, Martin Luther King, to think intensively and think critically. But education which stops with efficiency may prove the greatest menace to society. There it is again. The most dangerous criminal may be the man gifted with reason but no morals. We must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character, that is the true education. So here is the question then. Schools and universities, and that includes these wonderful places like the University of Queensbury, Queensland, Queensbury, Queensland uh, need to address harm-causing behavior. That is, psychologists, is one of our greatest challenges. That is to educate those who will run our banks in our corrupt, um, that run our religions and inspire, uh, that's the wrong one, isn't it? That's right. To be the clinician that the cures for diseases, we're going to train people to do that. To be the sciences trying to solve ecological problems. To train the lawyers trying to instigate a moral, just, and fair world. To train the politicians dedicated to helping the poor and creating opportunities for all. To run our media that seeks to inform and empower, not distort and confuse. To run our entertainments that inspire and uplift. To be the teachers for a new moral order. So this is what education is about. Because the people who are going to be our leaders and are going to be the captains of interest and so forth, a lot of these people have all come through our education. They are the educated, not the uneducated. So we have to put pro-social behavior at the heart of the human and endeavor. The fact of the matter is the human brain is tricky. It is not well designed. It has a serious dark side. The last three to 4,000 years, perhaps longer, has seen a lot of the dark side in humanity, and we still do. The unequal distribution of resources and what we're doing in the world is pretty awful. Our minds and cultures are like gardens, as I've said. So as we better understand how nature has built us, we can take responsibility for creating and cultivating the conditions for each human being to flourish. So I believe that for psychology, psychology is how do we create the conditions for our minds to grow? Just like preventative medicine, how do we create hygienic conditions? How do we create sanitation so that we're not constantly affecting ourselves with diseases? So medicine takes that issue, but how do we allow bodies to flourish and prevent diseases and immune and immunization and all the rest of it? As psychologists, we need to be pursuing this. So universities could and should be at the forefront of the service and endeavor by putting the study of pro-social behavior of self and others at its heart. The future is exciting, but it's also challenging. So over to you.